Well, I want to talk uh, about uh, contending for the power of God. Contending for the power of God. And one of the uh, contexts of doing this is thinking about the Global Bridegroom Fest tomorrow. It's just, that's what it's about. That's one thing. That's not the only thing that IHOP's about, but it's one thing IHOP exists for. That we would fight. That we would take the battle to the gates, if you will. That we would be those that have a vision for the fullness of the power of God. And more than a vision, we would back it up with our lives. We would fight the fight of faith. Because it is a fight of faith. It doesn't, when God gives a vision, God gives a promise, and God begins even to release it into manifestation, though there's rest in the inner man, there is a fight that touches our outer man. There's a struggle. There's a necessity to persevere. There are more promises in the Bible about persevering in the heat of the battle. I'm adding the words the heat of the battle, but that's the context. The necessity to answer the call and then to persevere in the midst of the call. There are more promises related to perseverance. It says in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10. Hebrews, I mean Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12. It says that you inherit the promise through faith and perseverance. I want to say that again. You inherit the promises through faith, yes. There is a rising up in our soul and saying yes. But it's through faith, Hebrews 6.12, and perseverance. And the Lord has called us to a marvelous thing here, the International House of Prayer. Uh, he's called us, there's number, there's several dimensions to it. I'm not trying to be comprehensive and lay them all out. But one of the dimensions that he has called us to is to see an open heaven over this place and over this city. To where there's an open heaven, I'm, I'm quoting the verse from uh, John 1, uh, verse 51, where Jesus said, the heavens will open. Uh, talking about a place of divine activity, that the heavenly realm being manifest into the earthly arena. Where the heavenly realm, the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit and angels and supernatural activity being manifest in the earthly arena. That's what I mean by an open heaven. It means that the, the power and the activity in the spirit realm would be openly manifest in, in a victorious way. And the Lord referenced uh, uh, an open heaven in John 1.51. You can read about that. Most of you are familiar with it. But God has promised us an open heaven, not just over this house, but over the city, where the uh, spirit of revival would be released, signs and wonders, the knowledge of God, powerful instantaneous conversions, demons coming out with one word. Oh, he speak one word, and the insane are delivered with one word. More than that, even in... Uh, presence worship is the way that the Lord spoke with the Paul Cain. He's about to release presence worship that in the very flow of worship, the, the, the power dimension would break forth healings, deliverances without even human agency. The Lord does it both ways. That's what we talk about in open heaven. And God has promised it over this place. God's promised it in response to our cry. It's not like the Lord says, I'll do it and I'm just, I'll just do it. He says, no, I'll do it, but I'll do it through bridal partnership. And bridal partnership, one dimension of it is called fasting and prayer. I want you to do your part in the relationship, and I'm going to wait until I hear the sound of your cry. Isaiah 30, verse 18. The Lord says, it says, the Lord is gracious, and he longs to be gracious. Isaiah 30, verse 18. The, long, the Lord longs to be gracious, but he waits until he hears the sound of the cry of his people. Then he acts. I want to say that again. Isaiah 30 verse 18. The Lord is gracious and he longs to show grace. He longs to. He goes, I want to more than you. It's not us convincing him. It's him convincing us. Beloved, it's not us convincing him. He says, I long to do this more than you long to see it done. However, I will not do it in a way that undermines bridal intimacy with my church. See, what we would like to do, just in our natural uh, mindset, we'd like to say, Lord, oh, you long to be gracious. You long to see the, the fullness of God break out. Fullness as ordained by God in, in this age. Because the fullness of God, I always, whenever I say the fullness of God, I think of the fullness. And so I like to say the fullness of God as ordained for this season. Because the fullness in the absolute sense is far beyond anything we can hear. I mean, that word is just mind-boggling. Fullness of God, oh my goodness. 
But uh, Isaiah 30, verse 18, the Lord says, I long, I long to do it. Well, Lord, we long to do it. What's the problem? The Lord says, I long to do it more than you long to do it. Well, Lord, we thought we're on the earth convincing you. And the Lord says, no, by the spirit of prophecy, I'm convincing you. I'm trying to convince you about my longing. However, I will wait until I hear the sound of the cry of my people. Well, Lord, why do that? The Lord says, because when I release my grace, it's going to establish intimate partnership with my bride. And if I release my grace in fullness apart from the, the pressing in of bridal relationship, of intimate relationship, the people of God will get so captured by the release of grace, so thrilled by the breaking in of the spiritual supernatural activity, they will go about their way and forsake relationship. The Lord says, no, I long to be gracious. It's my idea. It's not your idea. I long more than you long. However, I long that the grace that I manifest would establish my relationship with you, not undermine my relationship with you. Therefore, therefore, I will not release it until I hear the cry of my people. I will not release it in fullness. Now, the Lord releases a certain administration of grace no matter what. There's, there's an anointing on the word. There's just an anointing on the reality of the kingdom no matter what. It's operating at a certain level automatically. But the Lord's talking about releasing more than that introductory dimension of the kingdom of God. The automatic dimension that comes just by being born again. He says, I'm going to give it. But uh, history has, has proven that when the Lord releases a little bit more, a little greater measure, apart from the crying out, the sustained crying out, I'm talking about the corporate longevity of crying out together. When the Lord releases it, separated from that, the very release of blessing pulls the people off the track, even within five years. It's happened time and time again. At the five-year mark, the people are in another vein, and it's like burned stones. It's like the field has been burned, and it's hard to, to grow anything there again. The Lord says, here's what I'm going to do. He says, I long to be gracious. However, I'm going to hold out. And I'm going to let the cry of your heart not convince me. No, no, I'm already convinced. I'm convincing you. Not that you would earn it by the cry of your heart. No, no, I give it to you freely. I mean, you can't sing words and shout words and earn power. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, any of the angels in heaven would say, you can't earn the power of God by shouting words. It, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't earn it. We don't convince God, nor do we earn. But the Lord says, when you lift your voice together, whether you're singing or speaking, there is a dynamic that takes place in your heart. There's a receptivity. There's a divine connectedness that begins the process of taking place. And the Lord says, when that divine connectedness is there, you haven't earned it. You haven't, uh, uh, you haven't uh, convinced me to pour out grace. You're in a place now where the grace that I pour out will actually establish and enhance what this thing is about instead of the revival taking away what this thing is about, which is bridal intimacy. The very concept of God running His kingdom by prayer is a statement of His desire for relationship with His people. The very fact, I remember uh, years ago, uh, wondering about the fact of prayer, going, Lord, I remember when He called me to prayer in a very uh, very uh, 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 definitive way in May 1979, called me to intercession. I knew it. I remember I preached it to my young adult church in St. Louis. I'm an intercessor. The Lord made it so clear. I won't give the story, but it was a, it was it was one of those real uh, life. Uh, God grabbed a hold of my life. Life encounters. God apprehended me in, in May 1979. So you're an intercessor, and I, I remember getting up to the church said, "I'm an intercessor." And they said, "What's that?" I said, "I don't have a clue. I truly had no idea what an intercessor was. No idea." I went to the bookstores in, in town and looked, bought both books on intercession. There were no books on intercession. No, really. How many of you can remember 1979? There were few books on prayer and fasting. You know, just the one or two uh, standards. You know, Andrew Murray, maybe one by Watchman E, you know, sort of a book on it. And, and you know, we had Reese Howes and we had uh, you know, a couple, uh, uh, Charles Finney ones hadn't come out yet. And uh, we had Joy Dawson, of course, and the End Time Handmaidens had a couple. And that, it was really Dick Eastman. That was about it. I mean, you just didn't have books on prayer in those days. Of course, Ian Bounds and Little Ravenhill. I just remember those two. 
But uh, you couldn't get books. Very many books on prayer. And I so I went to the bookstore and said, you got any books? And well, we got one. And I went to the other Christian bookstore. Well, we well, we got one, but that one book sold. And I thought, man, I don't know anything about it. But the Lord called me to intercession. And I remember I announced it to the church. And we were all psyched up. And that's when I began the daily prayer meetings. And by the grace of God, I've had them every day since. I mean, 99% of the time since that day, since that, that announcement on that Sunday morning. Daily, every day, crying out in prayer meetings. And the Lord uh, uh, began uh, this journey, intercessory prayer, because I didn't know it would be this so many years. I'm still looking for the breakthrough. And the Lord says, no, I'm digging a big well. There's a root system going on here. There's a root system. And a lot of you, your root system began a long time ago. And others of you, you're new to this, and you're entering into the root system that a lot of moms and dads. I, I, I want you to raise your hand if you're in the room and you've been, intercession has been important to you for at least 10 years. I want you to raise your hand. Okay. Now, now, young people, look, just look at these hands. Now, if now, I want you to stand up. How's that? I, I, I want you to stand up. Those raise your hands. If intercession has been important to you for at least ten years, I, I want the twenty-year-olds to look. There's a root system. Look, this is. I love this. This is exciting. If you can do math at all, this is good math because you're entering into this. Now, I want you to raise your hand. If you've been, if it's been important to you for twenty years, give or take a year or two. It doesn't have to be exactly. I want you to raise your hand. Look at there. There's a. There's ten or fifteen of you. Twenty of you. Beloved, this is fantastic. This is a great root system. Go ahead and have a seat. Lord, I thank you for the moms and dads in the house. This is, uh, this is dynamic. This is wonderful. Anyway, I, I, I was perplexed because my idea of prayer, my idea of prayer was very different than it is today. And I said, okay, I'm in it. And I got the books and we started those morning everyday prayer meetings and we didn't know exactly what to do or how to do it. And and I remember I just wrote out by hand the apostolic prayers. And you know why I picked the apostolic prayers? Because I couldn't think of anything to pray. Meaning they, the guy said, what are we going to do tomorrow? I said, I do not have a clue. So I, I wrote them all out by hand. Uh, bad handwriting, but I wrote them out and Xeroxed them, made a bunch of copies. And, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, both guys that showed up to the first prayer meeting, I gave them one each. <laughs> We had them every day. I mean, we just had them every day. So we had two or three, four. And, man, sometimes we shattered the 10-member prayer meeting mark. You know, it was like, whoa. I mean, really, 10 was massive. Beloved, there is nothing wrong with five and three and seven-member prayer meetings. We getting so used to the larger meetings that some of the ones that are leading, and there's only 20 or 30 in the room, I go, we never saw 30 people in a prayer meeting. For, I'm talking about for years and years, we rarely saw a 30-member a, a prayer meeting. And some are kind of entering in at the blessing level before even the breakthrough. There's a measure of blessing. And the 30-member prayer meetings are kind of the old down-and-outers that nobody cares about. And I tell you, God and angels move at 30-member prayer meetings. And I was many years, I'm talking about 10 or 15, where 30 members was a stunning number. Not, it was not a, the first year or two. For many years, they were 5 and 6 and 8 at the prayer meetings. And sometimes 10 to whatever. I can't remember all the numbers. But, but anyway, I remember, I said, okay, God. And my first kind of approach, I was going to, I was going to convince God. And then, then that didn't work because it became clear he was convincing me. And uh, part of the prophetic history that uh, uh, we talked about on the uh, Encountering Jesus prophetic history tapes, that prophetic history, a significant part of that, the reason of it was God convincing me. He's saying, I'm convincing you. that you, The problem isn't for you to convince me to do this. I'm convincing you to do this. And that's one of the great reasons for the anointing of prophecy is to convince us of what is so clear to God. So I gave up the convince God mode. I said, okay, good. Then maybe, uh, I don't know exactly how this charted out just exactly, but I had a season of the earn it mode. I'm going to earn it. You know, I'm going to show God through my dedication. I'm going to give him a dedication so sterling, so historic, so above and beyond that even God can't turn me down. Well, so I went hard after the dedication so I could earn it. And, man, that just that didn't go very far. I mean, I had so many, so many black spots on the record. You know, I go, man, if I could just get rid of all. So, anyway, that one, that one didn't work. And then the Lord says, no, no, I'm dedicated to revival. And, and, anyway, how can you, shouting words that I tell you to say, how could that make you earn power? You can't earn by saying send power. I mean, there's no, there's no real, if you really think about it logically, that doesn't earn power. And so I spent a little time trying to earn it. And then I, then I was perplexed and a little dismayed, saying, Lord, i got so much to offer you. Here I am in a room telling you what you tell me to tell you. I mean, I, I could have won, you know, 
a city to the Lord by now if you just let me go. You know, Lord, I have so much I could offer you, and you've got me bound into this kind of strange little thing. I'm sitting in a room telling you what you tell me to tell you. It's so odd. I have so much more to give you. And the Lord just says, just go ahead and do that. You just tell me what I tell you to tell me. And I remember for some years I operated in that mode. It was a mystery to me. I did it. I, and I don't mean it was always good or I liked it, but I just said, I just don't get this. I don't get it. And then I started coming up with the idea, who invented running the kingdom this way anyway? I said, who would run a kingdom by weak people telling the king what he told them to tell him? I go, who would run a kingdom this way? I mean, nobody would. And I was, it's cute now, but it, it was perplexing to me why God invented this method of running the kingdom. It was an odd concept. I said, I, I'll do it, I'll preach on it, but secretly, between you and me, I think it's a strange way to run the kingdom. I really don't buy it. I'm sure in heaven I will agree, but right now I do not think it's a good use of human resource. <laughs> it's funny, but I, I was serious about that for a few years. It troubled me. It was an offensive concept to me. And some years had gone by, and then it began to touch me. The Lord says something like this. Or his, not that he said it, but the idea that if I, if I cause you to cry out and then I answer the cry, you will be stunned. You will be, you will have marvel. You will have surprise. You will connect the dots that when you spoke on the earth, I moved in heaven. And that will make you go, wow, I love you. You love me. He goes, there will be an awakening and awareness in your soul that when the crying goes, you see the, the human crying, you see the divine activity, it will stun you and awaken you to love. You'll go, this is truly amazing. You really do things when I talk on the earth. The Lord says, I'm going to give a long history, but I'm going to give every, an answer to every single prayer you pray. I will answer it from heaven. And beloved, there is not a wasted prayer. And one of the, one of the uh, uh, subtle things that happens is just like I said on the night watch. We'll go on 18 months praying some little two or three minute prayer and you look around, you don't know when it happened, you don't know how it happened. All of a sudden, the night watch is the largest prayer meetings in the house. How did that happen? I'm telling you, it's directly related to the idea of praying for it. And God does this. And then the Lord began to add a little bit more. He says, I'm not going to just wow you by letting you see the breakthrough and let you see the increase, because so many times we don't see the increase. Because we cry out in October, and in November we don't see it, or the October a year, or two years later we don't see it. And then when it begins to really come in a full way, 5 and 10 and 20 years later, sometimes we don't connect the dots. And so we, we, we miss some of the wow of what's happening. But the other thing the Lord's saying, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, cry, I'm going to cause prayer to be, be the place of encounter. You're going to have this open spirited posture towards my throne and just the repetition. What's happening? Your spirit is opening and there's a principle that when you behold the Lord, when you set your mind on the Lord in prayer, this is true, whether you're, it's worship, devotionally reading the Bible, interceding in a prayer meeting, when you're talking directly to the Lord consciously, you, you don't maybe understand this, but it's true, your spirit opens. When your mind is set, your spirit is opened to Holy Spirit influences in a greater way. Now, the Lord knows that. We don't have to know that. There's a tenderizing that's going on. Does it matter if there's three people in the prayer room or 3,000? It does not matter. When, when, when you come before the Lord, when I come before the Lord, and I go, I'm reading the Word, and I turn it in more than just Bible study, I turn it into that dialogue. And you want to you read the Bible and turn the dialogue. Jesus, you said in your Word here, when you talk in a direct way, when you set your mind, or you behold the Lord, that's the other biblical term, with the setting of your mind upon Him, your spirit opens up. There is a, a literal a literal cause-effect activity that happens in our human experience of which the process of, the process of prayer, it's not just the answer wows us, the process itself creates an intimacy and a tenderizing if we stay with it. And then when the Lord releases the grace, the intimacy and the tenderizing protects us under the weight of the grace of revival when it's released. Because the weight of the grace of revival is what pulls so many of God's servants off the path. I don't mean they deny the Lord, but they lose their way with God. 
when the weight of the answered prayer, the revival, I'm talking about the converts come, the miracles, the numbers come, the presence comes, all these begin, things begin to happen in a new level of manifestation. That's what I mean by the weight of the answered prayer, the weight of the revival itself. More times than not, it takes the servant of the Lord, whole leadership teams, off the path of pressing into God's heart. So the Lord says, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to, I'm going to wow you by delaying the answer till you cry out. I won't, and I'll even delay it some years sometimes, but when it finally happens, it's like the, you know, the uh, thing in John 16 when Jesus says the pain of the childbirth and the joy the mother has when the baby actually comes, the joy is so great, even though the pain was very intense, it, oh, it, the joy of the, of the release, the joy of the child being present causes the memory of the long-term pain and all that went along with it to, to disappear. And the Lord says, I may wait some years before I answer, but I promise you this, when the answer comes, the joy you will have will outweigh the years of waiting. It really, really will. It really, really will. But there is a cause effect. There is a joy. There is a, a stunning of the heart, even if it, whether it's a day, a month, or ten years, when the answer comes, wow, wow. But it's more than a wow when the answer comes. There's a process that changes us. But it's a subtle change. It's like leaven working in the, in the loaf in a positive sense. It's working mysteriously. These prayer meetings are not deserving us an answer. That never happens because you can't say words and deserve supernatural power. There's no economy in heaven that says if you say more words, you deserve more power. There's no concept of deserving. It doesn't work that way. But there's, we are preparing, we are, we, we're, a bank account is increasing, in a, and maybe that's a bad analogy, but there's a measure of increasing. The longer the time waits, the greater the joy when the answer comes, but more than that, the process of being changed in the process will protect us under the weight of the answer when it comes. It is absolutely the truth. And God is, is, is planning something so dramatic. And, I, and I'm not wanting to be self-serving, but at the same time, I want to be true to the prophetic word. He's, he's planning something dramatic in this house that needs a root system that is years and years and years a root system or a foundation. Because the weight of what's coming cannot be steady if the root system or the foundation of the years, not just the years of waiting so the joy, the wow is big, that's good, but I'm talking about the process that happens in our spirit through the years of waiting. And I don't mean just the patience of waiting. I'm talking about 10,000 times 10,000. We set our mind, therefore we open our spirit, and that's the principle people don't understand. When you set your mind, your spirit opens. It absolutely is a fact. So what it means in 2 Corinthians 3.18, you behold the glory of the Lord and you're transformed. When you behold the glory, your heart opens. Now the same thing happens in the negative. You behold, you behold immorality, your spirit opens every time you behold it. And that's how you get demonized. That's how you get demonized. You behold anything, anything you set your mind on, you open your spirit to. And that's why it's not a, a, it's not a kind of a, 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 an unimportant thing, what we behold. David said, I'll set no worthless thing before my eyes. I'll set no worthless thing before my eyes. I think that's Psalm 141, something like that. I can't remember, but I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. Because David understood what you set before your eyes, you open your spirit to. It's not just you get a little emotionally stirred up. If You know, if you see a... Uh, some occult movie, you get a little stirred up and you do the blood of Jesus and hope it goes away or something. No, it's more than you're stirred up for the hour. Your spirit opens. It really does. It, hope, it, it happens both sides. The kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness. The setting of the mind opens the spirit. And you can't measure it. It takes uh, people uh, sometimes a persistency in sin before they get demonized. And they really get demonized related to what they open their spirit to. They get demonized in that all those, I mean, that's why the movie industry, whatever kinds, the, the, you know, the, the immoral to the violence to the killer to the slasher to the thiser to the that or whatever, all those categories. 
It is the, the movie industry is just polluting the earth, and it's about to double, triple, quadruple, you know, whatever. The next 10 or 20 years, they're going to have a thousand channels available on your wristwatch, something before the thing is over for the whole earth. I mean, it's going to get so sophisticated, and, and the technology will be so cheap as they perfect it, you will be able to have access to so much to behold, the human race will, and the majority will choose the wrong things. They will open their spirit without knowing there's a correlation, there's a dynamic relationship, and it will weigh them down, and it will break them under the weight of it. Beloved, what we do outside of IHOP is critically related to what we do inside of IHOP. We cannot go out of IHOP our other life, open our set our mind, therefore, without knowing, open our spirit to a certain, a certain way to darkness. Then come into IHOP and flow in the spirit. It's not just hypocrisy. One guy might approach it, well, well, we're hypocritical, and, and uh, there's an element, there's some truth to talk about hypocrisy, but uh, that's not really the big issue. It's, a, it's about encounter. It's not about hypocrisy mostly, although, the, again, that that's a point that could be made. It's about encounter. When you set your mind on something, you do encounter it. Even if you don't think you do, even if you can't measure it, even if you can't feel at that moment, I promise you what you set your mind on, you encounter. And when you encounter it, it's a part of you. And it's subtle. You can't measure it, but it's a part of you. And you bring it into here. And I don't mean you, you give it to others. That's not my point. You bring it into here. And what happens? Now we're setting our mind on the Lord. And it's not like the Lord's angry saying, you're so hypocritical, I'll hide my face from you. He's just saying, no, I will cause you to live in the balance of what you open your spirit to. If you open your spirit to me, I will really be there in my mercy and tenderness. But I will be there to the measure you open your spirit to me. And when you open your spirit to darkness more, but you're on the IHOP staff, and you come in here and do it a little bit here, the Lord says, I will really give you a little bit. I will really meet you. You really will encounter me. Little segments, just like in the kingdom of darkness. They're just little segments of encounter, just little, little, or just little measures. It's not normally stunning. It's not even discernible. The Lord says, I'll do it either way you want. And so people come, well, I'm under warfare. And, uh, you know, I'm just under a heavy spirit. I go, no, when you live, when you fill your mind, when you fill your mind with darkness, and then you come in for your six prayer meetings or 12 prayer meetings a week and you want to do light, there's just a collision going on. It's absolutely a natural phenomenon. It, it, it's not, it doesn't take extra activity of angels and demons. It's just a, a, I don't know if natural is the right word, it's a predictable phenomenon. Let's say it that way. We have to guard our hearts. Uh, Proverbs 4, verse 23, it was Solomon that said, Guard your hearts with all diligence, for out of your heart flows the issues of life. He said, guard, set a guard on your heart. Don't try to go and dabble in darkness, whatever, you know, the subtle forms of darkness or the overt, I mean, extravagant forms of darkness, because you open your spirit and you can't shake it off in a day. It stays on you. Just like when you open your spirit to light, to the kingdom of God, you, and, and, uh, it begins to build in you. It begins to build in you, and then you get in a negative way for a season. And But you still have that, that uh, dynamic encounter over the months and years that God has, has released to you. And then when you get in a negative way and you're kind of doing a little this or a little that, the cry of God is built up in your spirit so great. And the scream of God, you are mine. No, you cannot do that. You go, man, this didn't used to be in me before. That's the positive buildup, if you will. That's not the best words. But that's the accumulation of little increments of divine encounter through the months and the years. It's a hold of you. You become ruined. You can't get free of it. Now, if you stay with it long enough and keep in a bad way, you'll get rid of that cry in your spirit. But I've seen many a committed people. Man, they're going hard for God and they get in some strange way for a while and the cry in their spirit, they built it, they didn't even know it. It's so real, they are the most miserable. You know, it's like Paul Cain says, they'll never be a successful sinner. They can't. They can't enjoy sin. They, they can't, they, ah! There's the scream that is just the predictable, accumulated buildup of, of setting their mind on light over the years. It's absolutely true. Absolutely true. But some people don't know that. They don't know that what they set their mind on, they open their spirit to. That's, that's why what we're doing in here, it's a three-member, a ten-member, a fifty-member prayer. It doesn't matter how big the band is, how many people. You know, some of the worship teams say, if, you know, if there's a lot of people, I want to lead it. If there's a little group, I don't. I go, it doesn't matter because you get the same download if the building's empty. You're in this thing for the download 
and to move angels and demons. And the number of people in the room may be a blessing to strengthen you as they respond. That's why we have the sacred trust. Because if there's more in the room, there is an enhancing of what they do. But we think and still... Get the download. They can encounter God in their spirit by truly setting their mind because it opens their spirit. That's why if we come up here and go through prayer meetings, going through the motions, but we don't really encounter, we end up with, I don't think it's negative, but we end up, well, it is negative in this way. We end up with nothing because you have to set your mind, open your spirit. And some people, and I've done this a number of times over the years where I just get through the prayer meeting, just raw faithfulness. And I didn't get anything out of it, but hey, my body showed up. My heart didn't make it, but at least, at least I was sitting there in the chair. And I said, Lord, sometimes that's the best I can do. But here's where it goes negative. It goes negative if you get used to doing that. And I've done that plenty of times. But as a rule, I go because I believe in the principle. I'm going to lock in, man. I'm not, I don't have time. I don't have time to waste a two-hour download, even though it's a small download from the Lord. I don't want to waste it. Though you can't measure it, though you can't feel it, over the years, you are a radically different human being. Your emotional chemistry is very, very different. But the reason it's negative to just kind of show up with your body and not engage your mind, although I've done that plenty of times, just because of weakness. I understand that. The reason it's negative, that if you slip into a pattern, that's how you always do it, then here's the negative. Then you believe you've tried prayer and it didn't work. And that's a lie because you never tried prayer. You went to prayer meetings, but you never prayed. To go to prayer meetings is not the same thing as praying. And it's, it's very possible, I have no doubt, just the way the human life works, that we will end up, when it's all said and done, having hundreds, probably thousands in our midst for a year or two at a time, that are out it's years down the road. I don't mean hundreds of thousands at a time, but cumulative over the many years before the Lord returns, if he, if he waits, if he tarries. I have no doubt that there will be many that were here one year, two years. And then, uh, and then they've gone back, and it's five years later, and someone says, prayer, and they go, he did the prayer thing. That's not true. They didn't do the prayer thing. They sat in the prayer room, but they never did the prayer thing. And that's the negative, is they believe they tried it, and it never worked, that it wasn't real. And that lie is a, they are actually in a far worse condition than they were before they ever came here. Because before they came here, they still believed God would be faithful to encounter them. If they'd been here a year or two, got into a habit, they got into a routine of showing up without encountering, then they believe it's a stronghold, it's a lie on their heart. And then they can't hardly ever hear the truth again about what God longs to do in prayer. Because there's a stronghold of deception on their heart. That because they sat in a chair and became a lifestyle because they had to, to wear the badge, they said, I want to be on the team, so i got to sit in the chair. One year goes to two, two year goes to three, the season's over, they go where they go. They're, they're actually in worse shape than they were because, the, you know, the principle, if you don't take new ground, you will lose the ground you have. Absolute fact of life. The only way you can keep the ground you have in the spirit is taking new ground. It absolutely, a scale of one to ten, if you're at a five, you can only stay at a five by reaching for six. The minute you quit reaching for six, you begin to move towards four. You never hit a five and stay at a five because that's where you hit. It's not like you, you know, move to a geographic area and you live there till you move again. No, the spirit's not like that. It's a vibrant, living reality. When you gain ground, there's a breakthrough. You gain ground, the Lord says, you will only keep the ground if you take more ground. When you quit taking ground, you lose the reality of the freshness you have right now. Absolute fact. So what the Lord's doing to us right now, he's saying this to us, something like this. Beloved, all the 20-year-olds that get to enter into the root system of all these moms and dads. What a great setup. The 20-somethings have the energy and the vitality of youth. And the older ones have the root system and the perseverance of, of age and maturity. And the Lord says, I'm marrying you together. And you're going to do it all for the 5- and 10-year-olds that are coming up after you. This thing's really real. The Lord's, uh, his answer is something like this. He goes, I, I, I'm going to hold it back a little while, but to the measure I hold back the answer, to the measure you will be wowed and stunned by the answer. The John 16, you will be overwhelmed at the joy of the answer equal to the waiting of pain of, of the, of the uh, gestation period and the childbirthing pain. The Lord says, I promise you the joy of the answer will be greater than the pain of waiting. I promise you that. The wow will be bigger than the woe. It really will be. 
But it's more than that. That's, that's fantastic. That is not the essence of it. The Lord says, if I have you wait 5, 8, 10, 20 years, there is an open, your spirit is open, and the very process of me taking that time has created the protection mechanism. So when the revival comes, the weight of it doesn't end up bruising you and breaking you. The weight of the revival is protected by the depth of the root system. But the root system isn't logging in years. It isn't. The root system, I mean, everybody 40 that doesn't die is going to be 50. You have to end up 50 if you're 40. That's how it works. My point being that that sounds... uh, pretty simple, but here's my point. There is no merit in just getting older, hanging out around the kingdom people. There is no merit. It's, well, I've been around this thing for years. That doesn't mean anything is happening in your inner man. Uh, logging time in itself does not in itself have any spiritual merit in itself. If there's not logging time in encounter, that's the key. The setting of the mind, the setting of the mind, the encounter. Luke 11, verse 34 to 36. Very powerful, powerful verse that Jesus spoke. I mean, I've been looking at this over the last uh, period of time, just staring at this. I remember the Lord gripped me with this passage some years ago, and and I've kind of, you know, got away from it. And then just recently, just in my personal prayer time, I was going, ooh, ooh. I mean, it's it's as high as it gets of divine invitation. Luke 11, verse 34. The lamp of the body is the eye. The lamp of the body is the eye. Okay. Therefore, let's read the whole thing and we'll break it down. Therefore, when your eye is good or your eye is single, which means your focus is set, it's your mind is set. That's what it's talking about. Your eye is good means your mind is set on the Lord. That's what it means in real practical uh, terminology. Therefore, when the eye is, is, is uh, good or the mind is set, the life is focused. You could put that the life is focused. Your whole body, your whole human experience is full of light. However, when your eye is bad, when your mind is set on other things, which, is the, which by the way, is the common pull of life. If you are not determined to focus your schedule and set your mind on this, you will automatically live unfocused on the things that God's called you to, and your mind will automatically be filled with the other things. He says, here's what happens. Your eye is bad. Your body, your human experience becomes full of darkness. Bad emotions, bad mindsets, consumed with bitterness. No tenderness, no flowing heart. The the, the common experience, now full of darkness, he's taking the two extremes, and most human beings are somewhere, you know, in between that. But he's he's offering the two extreme potentials, using the word full. And so I don't mean that every person that isn't full of light is therefore full of darkness. Most people are somewhere in between. They they even most of the church has got a little bit of light, they're born again. I mean they're God loves them, that's not an issue, but they live with their human experience, they live with their body. That's how Jesus is describing. He's talking about the human experience. They live with substantial darkness in their mind, their emotions, their responses. They have just darkness uh, 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 stilling their inheritance. Their heart rarely flows. They don't feel the things God created us to feel. It goes on and on and on and on. And we just learn to live with, a, with an inner life, with maybe not full of darkness, but the, an inner life dominated by darkness. And because our best buddies live that way, we live that way. We're not doing any worse than they're doing. We're all in the kingdom. A lot of them are preachers. A lot of them are in ministry. And we just live with substantial darkness. And we think, hey, that's as good as it gets. Let's hang in there and have a ball till the Lord comes. At least least let's make the best of it of our natural things. Let's get as involved as we can in this issue and this issue and this issue. Because anyway, this is as good as it's going to get. The Lord says, let me tell you this. He goes, "Verse, this is Jesus talking, verse 35. Therefore, take heed. Now, this is what I'm telling IHOP right now. And I, I feel like I'm, I'm in a prophetic flow because this is, I was going a total different direction today. But I just feel like the Lord is just kind of, so this take heed. I, I want you to take it as, a, as the Lord saying, take heed, IHOP, that the light that's in you does not turn into darkness. Because Jesus is saying the light in the human experience easily becomes darkness in the lives of born-again believers. Now, I don't mean they end up demonized and they end up losing their salvation and they end up hating God. That's not what I mean. Their tenderness gets 
becomes replaced with staleness. And then the old emotions begin to well up and, and the old, uh, the weeds begin to choke and still again the life of God on the inside. He says, let me tell you this. Jesus is going now to the other extreme. He goes, let me end this with a promise, he's saying, a divine invitation. If you're, if then your whole body is full of life, start, instead of the body, say human experience. Because in the, in the Hebrew mindset, when they thought of the body, they didn't think of the body. Uh, they, they had such a holistic view that our body was an integral part of our being and who we were, who we were as people. So Jesus was speaking in that idea. It's not your body versus your mind. It's talking about the whole of you. It's, it's the Hebrew uh, 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 paradigm of the body, of the physical and the spiritual, so integrated together. He goes on in verse 36. He says, if your whole body is full of light and you have no part, having no part that is dark. Now, this is way out there, right? No part. Now he says, you know, because he talked about being full of darkness in verse 34. Now he's talking about partial darkness. He says, let's say you're going all the way. You've got a vision to live in light where no part is darkness. You, you are setting your eyes single. You are filling your mind, therefore opening your spirit with this reality. Your whole body will be full of light. And then you will be, that John the Baptist verse, a burning and shining lamp. There you'll be, right there. Now, we all know about the John 5.35, John the Baptist. Jesus called him the burning and shining lamp. John the Baptist was the man Jesus used the phrase, the burning and the shining lamp of this verse. He used it about an, a human being, a fallen human being on the earth named John the Baptist. Now, we also know that this verse, most of you, comes from Isaiah 62.1. God says, I will not rest until I make you burning and shining lamps, in essence. Isaiah 62.1, that's the verse we pray over the night watch every single day. Isaiah 62.1, and we're going to stay with it. We want him to be burning and shining lamps. But, but let's look at this for a few minutes. Okay, he's giving the secret. The lamp of the body is the eye. He goes, the light source, the lamp, the light source of the human experience. Instead of the word body, put human experience. The light source of the human experience is the setting of the mind. That's what it means, by the eye, the setting of the mind. Let there be no mystery about it. The light source, the lamp. Of the body, of the human experience, is the setting of the mind, what the mind is focused on. Beloved, that's why these schedules I've been encouraging, we have to have focused schedules. If we don't have focused schedules, we will never have single-mindedness, never. It's dynamically related to a focused schedule. Because it takes time, it takes time to have your eye set on good. It doesn't happen overnight, it doesn't happen accidental, it happens with fierce intentionality. Fierce determination to have your eye set on good. The mindset on good. It's fierce. It's not, you, this is the, the same, uh, 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 Jesus said in Matthew eleven twelve. the violent take it by force. This will take violence to have the eye set on good. This is not something that happens because you come to Sunday night meetings and a few hot prayer meetings. This is a fierce determination in your soul that nobody can do for you. It won't be accidental. It won't be easy. It will have. It will be violent to do this. Now, I'm using the Jesus terminology of the violent take it by force, meaning it will take a fierce determination to set your mind on this. And this is where some of the the uh, patriarchs through church history. Uh, uh, you know, some they call the saints, and sometimes they're referred to as the mystics. Some are just the deep contemplative. Some are just the radical, abandoned men and women of God. You know, the Protestants call them one thing. The Catholics call them the other. The Orthodox call them. They all got different different terms. But these these burning and shining lamps and all the tr tr Christian traditions were these men and women that got a vision to have an eye set on good, full of light. Full of light. It's not about... It's not about logging your time in so you keep your IHOP badge. Man, they did the six permitting thing. Man, okay, I'll do six. Well, no, they're not going to know anyway. Maybe I'll do five. It's not about that. We are a place of encounter. It, we are a people who have gathered together because God has promised, the, we'll get to it next week maybe, to contend. June 3 is about contending for the power of God. For the apostolic experience of the book of Acts. We want to, Jude 3, we want to contend for the faith that was once delivered. We want to fight. 
We want to position ourselves together and individually to press in to get the things that God offered the church in the days of old. We're going to fight for those things. But then, it's not enough that we just contend for it together. Let's look at this. The lamp of the body, the light source of the human experience is the setting of the mind. Absolutely true. Therefore, Jesus says, when your eye, when your mind is set, when your mind is set, your, here's the principle, your spirit opens. Your spirit opens. You don't even have to be able to measure it. It happens. It happens. Your spirit opens. And I'm talking about worshiping. I'm talking about singing in the spirit. I'm talking about the corporate worship. We're just singing words to God. Uh, singing in the spirit. I'm talking about silence, but our heart is gazing because the heart's still set in with silence. And the whole room might be going, you may just be quiet. You can do it obviously outside this room, uh, very, very well outside the room as well. I'm talking about you're on the microphone crying out or you're in the prayer group just agreeing with the guy on the microphone or the lady on the microphone and your spirit's open. I'm talking about they're all shouting and screaming, your Bible's open and you're reading Isaiah, you're reading John or Jude, you're just talking to the Lord. It doesn't matter what version it is. It, uh, you can be in the healing rooms laying hands on people and you're saying, Jesus heal. You're still set in his direction. Your spirit's open. It could be prophesying. You're up there and your hand's laying on them. You're a little bit tired. And you're going, ah, and you're thinking, Lord, what is it? What is it? Without knowing it, your heart's set on him and your spirit's open. There's like 10 or 12 different ways, avenues. It's the same principle. You've set your mind, your spirit gets open. Does it matter which posture, I mean, which uh, application, the mind is set, the spirit is open. And just to top it off, the great thing, if you were not here, chances are more times than not you'd be in another situation with an entirely different environment. If you were not here, it's not like you would be in a vacuum somewhere. You would be really somewhere in time and space. And more times than we would want to admit, our mind would be set on something that's actually taking the light from us. The Lord's saying it's not just if you're not here, you know, you, you'll never make it. But, beloved, I have find, I find just the wisdom of gathering, the wisdom of setting my schedule, the wisdom of being focused keeps me out of more decisions. I escape more option fatigue out there of trying to decide what not to do just by being focused in my life. I can't imagine the number of opportunities I just lose sitting at home in front of my TV set. I, how, many I would, how many opportunities I lose just because I've got a focused schedule to be here? The Lord on the day, last day may say, Mike, do you know how much that simple thing of having a focused schedule and you showed up because you said you would and you didn't even do the math, do you know how much you escaped with a guy with your kind of finicky little energetic personality? Do you know how much trouble you would have got into as a believer just having free time? No, I'm serious. And I don't mean, mean just trouble doing something wrong, just having an active, vibrant, alive spirit and not having it focused. And inevitably, it's going to go somewhere else. I just can't, I can't even imagine what I've escaped just by the, the mandate of trying to build this house over the years. I mean, I don't mean just to, you're just trying to lead prayer meetings through the years. The Lord says, even that's my grace. That's my left hand. I, I delivered you. You didn't even know I delivered you. With your kind of personality, you'd have been in so much stuff over your head, you'd have never got out of it. Beloved, there's a wisdom to the routine of what we're doing. There's a protective wisdom. And we're here, and our bodies are tired, and we don't do it perfectly, but where we're praying for the sick, our, our, our mind is set. We're prophesying. Silence. Just our Bible study, praying it back to God, listening to one of the worship teams. Just sitting there, just praying in tongues, singing the Spirit quietly. On the microphone, or just praying or agreeing. Any mode, your Spirit's open, and, and dimensions of impartation are coming. But the, here's the tricky part. Just like in darkness, you can't measure it. You can't measure it. It happens. It happens in indiscernible increments. It's happening steadily. The guy says, my mind is so filled with immorality and pollution. He says, how do I get rid of it? I said, the exact same way. You got it. Day by day, hour by hour. That's how you get rid of it. I said, you get rid of it the same way you built. The way that you established this demonized lifestyle is the way you're going to get out of it. We're going to pray for you. We're going to break some stuff off of you. And then you're going to start setting your mind. And in a year, it won't all be done. It's this principle. You're going to begin to be filled with light. But look, look where this thing's going. Look where it's going. Verse 35, take heed. Beloved, take heed that the tenderness that you have two years ago is now 
not staleness today. Take heed that the tenderness you have today won't be stale tomorrow. Take heed. Verse 36. Oh, here's the part I like. The Lord says, what if? What if somebody got radical? What if an Anna who pressed it night and day? I mean a real Anna. We use the word Anna, and, and, and I like the way we use the word Anna, but Anna was like, was off the charts compared to what we do at IHOP. Anna was in a whole different realm. She didn't do six sets a week, I promise you. She did six sets a day. Anna was in a whole realm. There are Annas in reality. I like us using that term, but God is raising up Annas that were Annas of the measure that Anna was Anna. And some of them are in this house. God raises up an Anna. They speak to us out of history, of the wisdom. There's a Daniel. From his youth, Daniel 6.10. From his youth, three times a day from age 15. Here he is in his 90s. Three times a day. He didn't go to six prayer meetings a week. He did three times a day for 60, 70 years, 80 years. All the years. He set his mind, it says, Daniel 10, verse 12. He set his mind. Daniel 9, verse 3. He set his mind. He set his mind to go after this stuff. And angels begin to move in. He didn't earn a thing. It's not about earning. It's about posturing. It's about posturing. What if an Anna? What if a Mary of Bethany? What if a Daniel? What if a modern day Paul the Apostle? What if a David Brainerd from history? What if some of these kinds of men and women came forth out of this soil? This is good soil. It says they got the vision. I, I don't mean to... To complete the, the requirements. I mean, they said, forget all that requirement stuff. Verse 36, I want my whole human experience full of light with no darkness. Jesus said, you will be full of light. You will then be one of the bright and shining lamps in history that I promised. And, and beloved, Jesus said, the spirit, the violent, take it by force. No one's going to do it for you. No one's going to make it happen. No one's going to make you engage. And fasting truly speeds up the process. Speeds it up. Beloved, i would tell you, we've got to get fierce about this. Because of verse 36, if your whole body, your whole human experience is full of light, no darkness, you will be a bright and shining lamp that shines light out of you. I go, God, I, I don't want to be as good as they come this day in America. I want to be somebody walking right out of the pages of history. I want to enter into a realm that you have done in human history, Lord. This is the realm that God's calling. Not everyone's going to do that. But, beloved, there will be a, an atmosphere charged with reality and fire and passion. It's not about, do I have to do one more set? I did already those other three. Do I have to do the fourth? Away with all of that. God's called us into an abandonment to be a prayer furnace in the spirit and power to open the heavens, to cooperate, to have a root system. That's where God's calling us. Amen.